You're listening to the ADHD Support Talk Radio Podcast. ADHD Support Talk is brought to you by addclasses.com. Visit www.addclasses.com and sign up for free webinars and online events today. Hello, and welcome back to ADHD Support Talk Radio. I'm your co-host, Lynn Idris, and I am a productivity and ADHD coach. So I help overwhelmed professionals reduce procrastination, improve time management, and get more done more easily so that they have more time, more energy, and more bandwidth for what matters most to them. I am a woman with ADHD myself, and I come from a long line of ADHDers, so I have been where so many of my clients are, and I've come out the other side, so to speak. So I've gone from living in the constant state of chaos, overwhelm, and underperformance that most of you know far too well to live a life of more success and fulfillment than I once dreamed was possible, and I know you can share the same success yourself. You can learn more about me and what I do and the programs and services I offer at www.coachingadvantages.com. And if you'd like to join my next live online productivity workshop, you can simply text the keyword productivity to the number 33777 to find out about the next free event. Well, today I want to talk with you about meal planning. And before you click away or tune me out at the mere mention of that phrase, please reconsider and hang in with me a bit because I'm taking an ADHD friendly approach to a not typically ADHD friendly thing. Meal planning sucks, okay? I hear it all the time from my clients and I used to feel the same way myself. For one thing, it has the word planning right in it, right? So how fun can that be? I mean, seriously, it's not fun. It requires a lot of executive function and the kinds of things that are not so enjoyable for many of us. Meal planning also requires some degree of organization and thinking, right? And then there's the whole, you know, taking family members' tastes and preference into consideration if you're planning for a family or a houseful. But like so many of those mundane adult type things we have to do, meal planning is actually really important. We we waste money when we don't plan our our meals, right? We waste money on eating out, on delivery, on takeout, drive-through, prepared and packaged foods and those kinds of things. We waste money on food we buy and forget about until it shows up as some like science project looking thing in the back of the refrigerator or the freezer. We waste money on food we buy that we don't need and don't use because we have no idea what's in our cabinets, pantries, refrigerators, and freezers, right? When you buy groceries without planning, you end up with junk you don't really want in the house. You end up with duplicates, triplicates, quadruplicates, and more of the things that spoil and take up precious space. You guys know it happens, right? I hear the funniest stories from my clients about their pantries and cabinets, and I've been there myself. Actually, just last week... um, You know, even though I've got the grocery and meal planning thing pretty well down to a super simple process in my house, these things still happen once in a while, right? I had a really funny thing happen last week that I shared um, in some of my Facebook groups. Um, And as I'm recording this, we're still in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic precautions in my area. And I ordered my grocery delivery on an app I've never used before last week, so Of course, (laughs) true to form, I was doing it, you know, really quickly before I went to bed. So there's that. But instead of ordering four lemons, I didn't realize I was ordering four pounds of lemons. And of course, I didn't notice that it was almost $19 worth of lemons added to my cart. So I ended up with a lovely bowl of very pricey lemons on my counter for a few days and till a few of them started to get a little nasty, which prompted me to spend the better part of an evening juicing, zesting, and freezing about 25 lemons. I have no idea what I'm going to do with the juice and the zest of all those lemons, but I have them, you know, but that's the kind of stuff that happens sometimes, even when we're trying to plan with ADHD, right? And of course, it made me feel better when I talked to my big sister, who also has ADHD, and she told me she'd done the same thing with bananas a few months prior. So instead of ordering like six bananas, she ended up with six pounds of bananas delivered. So if you have ideas of what my sister and I can do with our combined stockpile of frozen bananas and lemon juice, let me know, right? But... I digress, you know, when we don't plan our groceries, when we don't plan our meals, and sometimes even when we do, things happen, right? But when we don't plan, cooking and eating takes more time, it takes more energy, it takes more bandwidth, because every meal requires thinking and decision making. 
you know, what do I have? What can I make with what I have? Do I have everything I need? Will everyone eat what I'm making? It can be exhausting. And of course, poor meal planning often leads to us grabbing what's convenient, right? So it leads to poor nutrition. All that eating out or takeout and prepared and packaged foods are generally not the healthiest choices for us and our families. But for most of my clients, the biggest challenge for meal planning is our perfectionism. We make it overcomplicated. We scour the web for apps and ideas and other people's systems that we try to plug ourselves into and maintain these sort of Pinterest perfect meal planning systems. And we either get shut down by the prospect of having to do that elaborate perfect planning or we go all in on the planning and create these elaborate over the top systems for meal planning that we can't maintain. We might burn ourselves out with the planning so that we don't have anything left for the execution and what we create isn't sustainable. I've had some clients come up with some pretty creative ways to address their struggles with meal planning. I can't tell you how many clients have come to work with me over the years and I find out that they go to the grocery store almost every single day. Now that's an alternative to planning, but it's not a very efficient or effective alternative to planning, right? If that's you, even if you pass right by the grocery store on your way home from work, do yourself a favor, grab your timer, and on a few different trips, time how long it takes you from the moment you turn into the grocery store lot, how long it takes you to shop for the things you buy, how long it takes to stand in the line to check out, how long it takes you to load it in your car and get back on the road. If you multiply that times five or seven times a week or however often you're doing it, you're wasting several hours each week that could be spent doing something you actually want to do, let alone the thinking and the energy it takes. So imagine if you cut that down just one or even two planned trips each week. Yes, the shopping part might take a little bit longer, but the rest of it will be will be taken care of, right? The rest of it will be eliminated. Think about what you would do with that extra time, right? And it's more than time, it's also energy and bandwidth. So if meal planning is something you struggle with, I'm gonna give you some simple suggestions that I hope you'll take and run with to create something that works for you and your family. And if you have some tips, strategies, or suggestions of how you make meal planning easier, please join us in the ADHD Support Talk Facebook group to share with us there. I know you guys have some creative ways you manage meal planning that could really help the others in the group. So I am all about simple and practical, right? So when I'm working with a client on this, we want to create something easy to set up, easy to use, and sustainable. Sustainable is key. So I start with the list, right? In my house, we have a running grocery list. Years ago, I hung a notepad um, on a hook inside a kitchen cabinet door and attached a pen to it where I jotted down what we needed as I figured out or found that we needed it, right? So as we ran out of things or as I decided we wanted things, I would add it to the list for next week's trip, right? And when we decided whatever the meals were, I added it to the list and I would just grab that list and take it with me to the grocery store. Of course, I kept it with inside the cabinet door on a hook because I didn't want it to get scooped up with all of the other, you know, notepads and papers and all in the mail and all of that stuff. So I always kept it where it was easy for me to find it. And I always just grabbed it and took it with me to the grocery store. I absolutely positively never go to the store without a list. That's the kiss of death for me. I will turn up and turn around and go home and get the list if I have to. I will end up with a bunch of crap I don't need, forgetting the things I do need and going back to the store again in a couple of days anyway. So I will absolutely turn around and go home if I realize I don't have my list, seriously. And, you know, as my kids got a little older, I would just call someone and have them take a picture of the list and text it to me if I forgot it. So later, I hung a little whiteboard inside that cabinet door there instead. It was just a thin little whiteboard that my mechanic was giving out with the name of his business on it. But it was a little bit bigger than letter size. And I would grab that and take it with me to the store. And then after whatever I bought at the store got wiped off and the list was all ready to go for the following week. Eventually, I took whiteboard paint and painted the inside of that cabinet door and marked off sections of the inside of the cabinet door 
for different stores. I marked it off with a Sharpie. So we have a little square for things we need at the home store, a little square for things we need at the liquor store, a little square for things that need to be picked up at other places and so on. And I keep a wet erase marker inside the cabinet and my family is trained now to write things down as they use the last of them or as they get low or as they realize they need things themselves. And then I just snap a picture of the list on my phone and use that to shop. Now, if you're like me and you hate to shop, one of the things that makes it a lot easier and a lot less tiring for me is that I make my list in the order of approximately where things are in the store I'm going to that week. So if I'm going to um, maybe Walmart this week, the list is pretty much in the order of where things are as I go through Walmart. If I'm going to another store, it's pretty much in that order. You know, once in a while, I'll change my mind about what store I'm going to. So I'll actually either rewrite the list or move things around before I go because it makes it that much easier easier for me. You know, but that only takes a few seconds and it really does make the shopping so much easier and so much less sort of tiring for me. I always find that grocery shopping makes me really tired. Um, I think it's all that thinking and deciding and looking for things. And, you know, nowadays, COVID time, making sure you're going the right way down the aisle in the right direction and that you're not getting too close to everyone, all that stuff. So it does make it a lot easier. Having some sort of perpetual list also makes it much easier. So you don't have to sit down and rack your poor tired brain for the myriad of things you may or may not need, right? I've had clients do all different kinds of things. Um, keep a list of the things they buy regularly in an electronic document or a spreadsheet. And they reuse that list every week and just cross off the things they don't need and add the few out of the ordinary things they do need. So having somewhere or something to start with makes the whole thing a lot easier. When I'm ordering groceries online for delivery or pickup these days, most of the stores I shop at save my past purchases as favorites or as my, like my prior orders so that I can add things that may not have made it to the list. Kind of like how walking up and down the aisles prompts you to remember things you might need. So at least you're not starting from scratch, right? For planning meals themselves, I often encourage my clients to reverse engineer or backward plan their meals. So grab a dedicated notepad or notebook or hang a piece of paper inside a cabinet door or start a note on your phone. And over the course of a few weeks, simply jot down what you ate for each meal after you eat it. So after a few weeks, you'll have a list of the things that you and your family eat most, and you can add to that over time as you have other things that you have as for your meals. Then when you're deciding what meals you want to plan for the week, you literally have a menu from which to choose. You just decide how many meals you need, put them on your calendar or make a list by the day of the week that you hang in your cabinet or on the side of your fridge or something, and you're good to go, right? You can move things around as you need to very easily. There are a million variations of this and a million ways to tweak this, and you really are limited only by your imagination. I've had clients who create, over time, a stack of index cards, and they gradually add a meal, you know, to on a card, you know, every time they have a meal. One client punched a hole in the corner of her cards, and she kept them all on a ring. Another client kept his in a recipe box categorized by the type of protein in the meal. So we had a section for beef meals and one for chicken, one for seafood, one for vegan, that sort of thing. I had another client who wrote her meals on little strips of paper as she made the meals and stuck the strips of paper in a mason jar, kind of folded them up. So every week she would pull out six strips of paper for that week's dinners, knowing that she would eat out or get takeout one meal. And that would be their meal plan. So each kid got to pick two. So it was kind of a fun thing for them. If they picked a meal, nobody wanted it, it would go back in the jar, right? When my kids were younger, everyone got to pick one meal each week. That way, at least I knew I was guaranteed that there was at least one meal that each kid wasn't going to whine about. Of course, I had veto power and I gave them the rules, right? Real food, not junk out of the freezer or a box, those kinds of things. We're not having Easy Mac for dinner. And most of the time, they'd pick the same couple of meals over and over. So those meals got a little heavier rotation. For many years, I just kept my running list of meals on a notepad inside a kitchen cabinet, and we would pick the meals for the week, and I wrote them on my paper wall calendar. Eventually, I got a little more ambitious, and I took six weeks of those meals from that calendar, and I put them in my Outlook calendar as appointments that recurred every six weeks. 
So for meals that are more seasonal, like my family wouldn't be thrilled about eating chili or, or hot chicken soup in the dead of summer, I would put two meal options for that recurring event. There are so many different ways that you can do this. And I know some of you are going to have great ideas. And you can move things around. You can change your mind anytime you want to. That's the real beauty of planning, right? It actually creates freedom. So when you're not bogged down by making decisions over and over and over again, you create free time and you create free mental space for other things. And of course, you save a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of money along the way. So I hope I've given you some quick ideas here today, but I really hope I've given you some ideas on making meal planning easier and simple and imperfect. Because as I always say, done will always be better than perfect, right? So if you give yourself permission to keep it simple, tweak, play, and experiment as you go, I know you can come up with something that works for you and works for your family. And again, if you have ideas or insights, We'd love to have you join us in the ADHD Support Talk Radio Facebook group to share with our community there. Your ideas may give someone else just the seed or just the spark that they need to tweak and turn into something that can really be helpful for them. I'm Coach Lynn Idris, and as always, thanks for listening. I appreciate your attention, and I'll catch you next time. Take care.